Welcome to the section on neural networks. So a neural network is a nonlinear predictor, y hat is g theta of x, which has a particular layered form. Um, one way to think about a neural network is that it incorporates aspects of feature engineering into the predictor. So one way of uh, interpreting this is that automatic feature engineering. That's one of the strong reasons why neural networks are so popular, is that for very complicated classification and regression problems, it's not obvious what the right choice of features is. And having a, a system which can automatically determine the right choice of features is very powerful. Uh, as a consequence of this, the number of parameters uh, which are specify the particular neural network can be very large. In other words, the dimension of the variable theta. Uh, and that means that P here could be in the millions or tens or hundreds of millions. And uh, that can make training difficult and uh, uh, time consuming. Certain neural networks can easily take weeks to train. Uh, but however, the other side of the coin is that they can perform very well, uh, especially when you have a lot of data to train them. Uh, the resulting predictor that you get uh, after training is extremely hard to interpret. Essentially, it's a, it's a black box. It takes in an X and gives you back a, an estimate Y hat. And how exactly it did that is somewhat mysterious. Uh, if you compare that with, in particular, a linear predictor uh, where Y hat is theta transpose X, then the meaning of the individual entries of theta is very clear. It tells us how much increasing certain components of x affects the prediction y hat. For a neural network, it's extremely difficult to interpret what the particular parameters theta i actually mean. So, in a, a neural network, in particular here, we're talking about feed-forward neural networks. There are other types of neural networks which we will see later in the class. So a feed-forward neural network consists of a, a composition of functions. Y hat is G3 composed with G2 composed with G1 of X. And that's in the case where we have three layers, but we might have any number of such functions. And those functions are called layers. We might write this using composition notation. G is G3 composed with G2 composed with G1, where the composition operator is denoted by a circle. Uh, some people would call this such a neural network a multi-layer perceptron. We often write the uh, predictor composition in terms of individual variables, you might say z1 is g1 of x, then z2 is g2 of z1, and then y hat is g3 of z2 for our three layer example. And each of these vectors zi is called the activation or the output of layer i, where layer i is just the function gi. And zi is a vector, it has a, a dimension di, which depends on the layer. And those layer of dimensions need not all be the same. Um, and in particular, sometimes they grow and sometimes they shrink, uh, depending on the application. Uh, we uh, um, sometimes write Z0 is X and D0 is D, the dimension of the number of uh, features which have been embedded from the raw data 
And so we still have a, a basic feature map which constructs x from u. x is phi of u. But then we don't do feature engineering typically with a neural network. Instead, we allow the layers to provide features which are used by subsequent layers. In, this, in the case of our three-layer network, we have Z3 is Y hat, the prediction. And then D3 is the number of components of Y hat, which would be M. So in particular, that means that the predictor input X and the predictor output Y are also considered activations of layers. We might visualize this as a simple graph where we have X coming in on the left passing through the function g1 to generate z1, which is passed into g2 to generate z2, which is passed into g3 to generate y hat, which is just c3. These layers have a particular form. Each layer is a composition of a scalar function h with an affine function. So gi of zi minus 1 is h composed with theta i transpose 1 zi minus 1. And this 1 comma zi minus 1, remember that notation. That notation means if I have two vectors a, b, that's the same as stacking them up on top of each other. And that means that theta transpose 1 comma z means theta transpose 1z. The matrix theta i is, uh, has dimension di minus 1 plus 1 by di. It's the parameter for layer i. And uh, the output of theta transpose 1z is, is a vector h here is uh, a scalar activation function. It takes real numbers to real numbers. And so the way it is applied to the vector, the meaning of that notation, is that it's applied element-wise. So in particular, if z1 uh, uh, is equal to h of q, okay, let me just call it z for the case of argument, then that means that z1 is h of q1, z2 is h of q2, and so on. So when we have m layers in our neural network, we have m matrices theta1 through theta m. And those are the parameters that we need to choose when training. Now we can explicitly divide up the components of the matrix theta i as follows. We'll write theta i is alpha i beta i, like this. And here alpha i is, uh, uh, is a, uh, is a, a uh, row vector. So that's alpha i1 alpha i2, all the way up to alpha i sub di, where each of these entries are scalars. But beta i is a matrix, and its, uh, its entries are beta i1 up to beta i j, and each one of these is a vector of dimension d i minus 1. Now, if we take that notation, and then we say, well, we're going to multiply theta transpose by 1z. So in particular, for the ith layer, we're going to take theta i transpose multiplied by 1zi minus 1. That works out to be this vector alpha plus a vector whose components are simply each of the form beta transpose zi minus 1. So each one of these entries of that vector is the linear part, 
And then there's the constant part here. So just as we might expect for an affine function, an affine function in general takes the form a times z plus, uh, let me not call them that, let me call them uh, c plus d times z, where d is a matrix and c is a vector, and this is our c, and this is dz. So then the layer map zi is gi of zi minus 1 means that we take each of the components of this affine function here of ij plus beta ij transpose zi minus 1 and pass that through the activation function h. And this sort of function, this sort of function right here, it takes a vector zi minus 1 as an input and returns a scalar, which is the jth component of zi. That's called a neuron. People often write those like this. What's coming out here? is zij and then we have it coming in components of zi minus 1 1 zi minus 1 2 zi minus 1 3 and that's a single neuron and our in our layer has many such neurons each one of which is giving out a different component. So this would be zi2. This would be zi1. And this is fed by the same inputs. And so this would be a, a layer which has two outputs and three inputs, and it consists of two neurons. Now these constant terms in the affine functions are called, the vector of constant terms is called the bias of the neuron. And uh, so in this layer, which has two neurons, there are two scalars, alpha I1 and alpha I2. Those are the two biases of that layer. And the betas are the input weights. Now, activation functions, there are two commonly used choices for activation functions. Um, uh, they're chosen to be nonlinear. In particular, if they were linear, then g theta would just be an affine function of z, which would be a linear predictor for a single layer. And in particular, if I compose a single layer g i, which is linear, with the next layer gi plus 1, well, all I'm going to end up with is one nonlinear layer where the two, where the, the affine part of the combined layer is simply a composition of the two affine parts. If I put a nonlinear function in place, then there's a difference between g1 composed with g2, which is a function which cannot be expressed as a single layer. So the most common activation functions are called the ReLU. Uh, we've also used this notation A plus, the positive part of the number A, or the maximum A0, and it's, it's this function which we've seen before. It's 0 when the input is negative, and A when the input is positive. Uh, the other very common activation function is this function e to the a on 1 plus e to the a, which is a smooth function which varies between 0 and 1. At 0, it's exactly a half. As a tends to infinity, 
it tends to 1. As a tends to minus infinity, it tends to 0. It's a scaled hyperbolic tangent function. We often draw explicitly the neurons in a neural network as a, a graph. Here's, a, here's, a, here's such a graph. Here we have a, a neural network which has three layers. And um, we have, uh, this is the output, this vector here is uh, the feature vector x. Then we have z1 is this vector. And so this would be x, which is equal to z0. We map that through through g1 to get z1. Here we have z2, which we map z1 through g2 to get z2. And then we finally map through g3 to get y hat. Um, and we can interpret on this graph each of the edges, the lines that connect vertices within the graph as uh, having a corresponding parameter. So each one of them would have a corresponding entry in the theta matrix. In particular, here we're going to see, well, let's look at the one that's labeled theta 1, 2, 4 relates the fourth component of Z1 to the first component of Z0, which is X. And so each edge has a theta associated with it, but there are also thetas that live inside the nodes, which provide the biases. So it's only the weight terms that are associated with edges of this graph. Um, so each vertex here is, it's a component of an activation. And the edges are the individual weights. Uh, here's an example of the sort of thing you see if you construct a randomly chosen set of parameters. You see one of the function that looks something like this. This is, um, here is, we have a, a three layer neural network uh, with two variables x1 and x2 at the input. And uh, as a result here, we have theta has three, uh, three rows. The first row here, that's the biases. Here are some more biases. Here are biases. And the remaining entries are weights. So the second, uh, the output of the first layer the input to the second layer is a vector which has dimension four. And then uh, the output of the subsequent layer has dimension two here. And then we have an output which has dimension one, which is y hat. And so the resulting function is a map from the two dimensions here to the one dimension at the output. Uh, it's, there's certain terminology that's very commonly used for neural networks. If you have an M layer network, then layers one through M minus one are called hidden layers. Uh, layer M is called the output layer. Very often, if you're doing regression, you do not use an activation function on the output layer, or more specifically, use the identity activation function in the output layer, H of A is A. Um, in the case of regression, you can see why that is. If you look back at the activation functions we typically use, if the output layer was using, for example, the sigmoid activation function, then it would only be able to generate output values or predictions between zero and one, which of course wouldn't work if we were trying to predict uh, y's which didn't lie in that range. Or if we were using ReLU, then uh, 
we'd only be able to put it non-negative values of y hat. Uh, the number of layers M is called the depth of the network. Uh, and people refer to networks which have a large M and large varies, but at least three would be typical, um, as deep learning. Um, very often for neural networks which are used for, say, image classification, we may have 15, 20 layers or many more sometimes. Um, Now, when we are doing training with a neural network, we do regularized empirical risk minimization, as we've seen before. We pick the layer parameters theta 1 through theta m to minimize the empirical risk with a regularization term added. So the empirical risk is, uh, as always, the average loss function evaluated on the training data set, where here g theta is the neural network map from inputs x to output y hat. Now the regularization term uh, doesn't regularize the bias parameters, uh, the alpha ij's, the constant terms in each of the layers. It only regularizes the, uh, the weight terms. Um, and this is because uh, we have uh, no need to regularize terms which don't affect the sensitivity of the network. Uh, common regularizers is sum of squares is very common. L1 is also very common. Um, and in particular with L1, we can expect to see sparsification of the, of the neural network and some of the weights will end up being zero. And that allows us to do what's called pruning the neural network, simply re removing entries which have zero weight and then retraining. That might correspond to removing entire neurons or just removing particular paths through the network. Uh, typically, for the when you're using a neural network predictor, you cannot minimize the regularized empirical risk exactly. Um, uh, the, the, the special case of a convex loss function, a convex regularizer, and a linear predictor, that's a, a very special case in which one can exactly find the optimal solution. For the neural network predictor, then even if you have a a uh, quadratic loss and a quadratic regularizer, there are there are no algorithms that will solve the problem exactly. Um, so training algorithms instead find approximately optimal solutions. Uh, and these might be local op locally optimal or they might be close to locally optimal. And we're going to see what methods you use for do that. These are iterative training methods. Uh, and these can take a long time. Uh, here's a particular example. Uh, this neural network has, I think, four or five layers. It's just got two-dimensional input and one-dimensional output. And it was trained on roughly 100 data points, some of which you can see in the plot. And you can see that it's done an interesting job at fitting it. Um, of course, we can't see all the data points because some of the points are underneath the surface. And, uh, uh, and it's, uh, it's hard to have any intuition for what either the meaning of the parameters is or how good a fit this is in the space of our uh, possibilities associated with the particular size of the neural network that we have. Uh, all we can do to evaluate how good it is is validation. Uh, in Julia, this uh, looks like this. Uh, this is uh, a, a, a glimpse at the neural network regression function that was used to train the previous example. Uh, some things to notice about it. Um, uh, this here defines the network structure. 
So it says that um, uh, we have uh, three layers. The first layer layer one has D inputs and 10 outputs and a ReLU activation. The second layer has 10 inputs and 10 outputs and also a ReLU activation. And the third layer has 10 inputs and M outputs, where M in this case is 1, and D in this case is 2, and it has an identity activation because we're solving a regression problem. Now, uh, what these, these, um, these functions here, the function dense actually returns a layer function. So when you call it dense D10, the activation function value, it will return for you a function f. We could just call it g1 equals. And then we'll get g2 is dense this, and g3 is dense of whatever we called it. And then we might say our overall neural network, let's call it uh, the predictor g. We would like to be g3 composed with g2 composed with g1. Now in Julia, you can actually type this. That's totally fine. If you're, if you happen to know where to get the Unicode symbol for the circle on your keyboard, and if like me you don't, then you can just write chain of G1, G2, and G3, and uh, that's exactly what we're doing there. So that's just composing functions, and that means that if we want to apply the resulting predictor to an input. We just take G, which in this case we called model. Let me just call it model. And we could do model of a vector X, and that would be Y hat. And so Y hat is model of X. We'll execute the neural network predictor and return for you the prediction. Now the parameters, the thetas, are, they're not called alpha and beta in, in flux. Here we're using the flux library. So before we run this code, we need to type using flux the top there. Uh, the parameters are stored inside the layer functions. And the way one accesses those is the following. So in particular, I can once I've start once I've composed model is chain g1, g2, g3, I can get back the functions. I might get them back by saying g1 is equal to model brackets one. And that accessing the, the first component of model, even though model is not a vector, model is really a composition of functions. It's been set up inside Julia in such a way that when I access the first component of model, what I get back is the first function, the first layer of my neural network. And then I can access its bias and its weights. Its bias is called g1.b and its weights are called g1.w. And so g1.b is a vector, we call the vector alpha on the slides, and g1.w is a matrix we call the matrix beta on the slides. And so you can see here that uh, we have a regularization function which is constructing, taking the norm squared of the weights of each of the layers and adding those up. And that uh, that's our regularizer. When we want to construct a prediction, we just call the model function on x that returns us back the prediction. In particular, if I have an X and a Y to, to uh, corresponding to a particular record, then I can compute predict X, predict Y, predict Y of X minus Y, and that's the error. 
and I might take the norm squared of that to compute the quadratic loss function. And here's my overall objective that I'd like to minimize. And this function train does the hard work of actually minimizing over the parameters and over the data, the cost function. Those are the things it takes. The cost function, the parameters, that's a special function in Flux which extracts the parameters out of each of the layers. And uh, there's the data which it iterates over. And here we return the model. And so we would call NN regression with an X and a Y and a regularization parameter lambda. It will return for us a model. We can then compute the corresponding predictions over our data set. We have a function here called predict all that does that. You give it a model and an X, which is a data matrix, and it iterates over each row of the matrix X, calls that little x, and calls model X on it to give us a corresponding Y hat. And then it stacks all those up to re return for us a matrix, which we might call capital Y hat would be predict all, predict all of model x. And so if we want to compute the, the RMS error, for example, of our predictions, we call predict all on our model and our training data, and we compare that with our true training y's target variables, and we compute the RMSE. And so Julia's Flux library is really quite efficient and clean at uh, allowing us to construct neural networks. And you can see that we can construct neural networks of any size we want and, uh, uh, and train them. Of course, I haven't told you yet how the training function works. And we're going to defer that uh, discussion of exactly what the how the training function works until the last few lectures of the class, uh, and, but for now we're going to use the training function provided with, um, provided with uh, Julia, provided with Flux. Now one way to think about neural networks is that they really have a very similar form to the feature engineering pipeline. We start with an X and we carry out a sequence of transformations or mappings to that X. Um, and eventually we come out with a Y hat. Um, the di distinction is, is that feature engineering mappings are chosen by hand. They typically don't have any parameters or have very few parameters and you can interpret what they mean. Um, we might say predict, we might can do feature engineering by taking the product of two features to construct a new one. And we know very well that if we take the product of two features, then that product is going to be large when both of the individual components are large. Um, in, in contrast, the neural network mappings, well, those are a specific form that uh, we're not choosing by hand. It's just a, it's just a category that we have. Um, and they have lots of parameters. Um, and we're not choosing those by hand at all. The training process is, is choosing the parameters, which is going to determine the, the resulting map. Um, and so one way to think about neural networks is that they're doing data-driven, automatic feature engineering. So one of the very common ways nowadays of using neural networks is to use what's called pre-trained neural networks. Um, one uh, trains a neural network to predict some particular target variable. Um, so say, for example, one is trying to distinguish uh, different uh, uh, features in the road from images for a self-driving car. And one has trained a neural network to classify a whole bunch of different road sign types and a bunch of different vehicle types and bicycles and construction and traffic cones and all the other things one sees on the road. And that training process would be done with a very large data set and take some considerable time. Um, and then what you do is you say, well, I've got this neural network, it's very large. We're gonna fix the parameters 
and take that the output of the last hidden layer and use those as features to do some other prediction. So after doing all that training, we suddenly realized that actually what we need to do is we also need to be able to distinguish things we hadn't thought of before, a particular type of road sign or a particular type of uh, traffic obstacle. Well, then we don't retrain the parameters in the neural network that we have. Instead, what we do is we retrain only the last layer of the neural network, or we simply take all of the outputs of the first n minus 1, m minus 1 layers of our neural network and feed those in as features to some new neural network or to some new predictor of some other form. And this actually works quite well even if one is training for quite a different task. Um, if one has trained a neural network to do, for example, one type of image classification, then one can often use it to do a different type of image classification. Uh, this is called uh, pre-trained neural networks. Uh, we saw two examples of these in the earlier sections when we looked at VGG16 for images and we looked at word to vec for English words. Both of those were pre-trained neural networks and we viewed them there as feature maps. And of course, if we're not training their parameters, that's precisely what they are. So let's summarize. Uh, neural networks training needs a lot of data. Uh, it can be difficult and can take a great deal of time. And the resulting neural networks are not interpretable. However, they often work really well, uh, better than anything else for many problems, in particular image classification, uh, the uh, best neural networks far outstrip any other methods that we have. Um, and uh, one way to think about them is that they're uh, automatic feature engineering. 